Breaking news! Venomous Woe overcomes his camera shyness! Hi, guys! <laughs> Yay! Wait, wasn't there something I was supposed to be doing? Oh, right. Introducing the Rusty Spoon. Well, all new equipment and the conquering of inhibitions aside, let's begin. I don't like it when religious people ask questions of atheists, because 99.9999999% of the time, they aren't even real questions. Whereas an actual question is posed with the goal of improving one's understanding of the world or of a particular worldview, questions from the religious are often rhetorical devices used to advance their worldview. These questions, rather than inquiries such as, what is your definition of atheism, or could someone please explain the principle of common ancestry as it applies to evolution, are often instead loaded phrases like, why do atheists hate God, or why is evolution being shoved down everybody's throat? Today's subject video, and even five questions on evolution and science by YouTuber Mere Christian Logos, demonstrates my grievances perfectly. His five questions are designed to be gotchas, trying to expose the alleged foolishness of atheist arguments, and the facade of intellectual curiosity wears thin really fast. This is Venomous Woe, and I will be dispensing ice cream to children with a rusty spoon. spoon. So, into the questions. Question number one. Uh, why is there, there uh, this generalization uh, that at least I seem to observe? And uh, uh, there's oftentimes language uh, used uh, that suggests this, that those uh, who... Uh, believe in evolution think those who do not uh, believe evolution who uh, find it problematic uh, <clears throat> reject science in, in as a whole generally so why is there this generalization from going from rejects uh, evolution to reject science as a whole well, aside from people like Gear Up that have flat out dissed science, the reason why people get the impression that creationists do not acknowledge science is their rather selective attitude towards scientific principles. In other words, creationists pick aspects of science that agree with their worldview to enshrine as actual science, while they ignore, butcher, and flat out reject principles that do not. Or to put it another way, scientists examine facts and propose theories based on those facts. Creationists propose the theories first and then just shove whatever they can into it to make it seem plausible. This is an insult to the scientific method and leads me to believe that creationists don't really place any stock in science at all. Question number two. Uh, it's on a question of methodological naturalism. Now science today is defined as methodological naturalism. I observed in the debate Christopher Mowdy uh, defines science as methodological naturalism. Uh, the felon free defines science uh, following the evidence where it leads, and Christopher Mowdy said that that's a very liberal uh, definition of science. Okay. Now my question is on the idea of uh, defining science as methodological naturalism. Uh, assuming that there are only natural explanations for natural phenomena, is this not simply question begging? Science as methodological naturalism is an apt description, because scientific experiments can only deal with claims that are testable. The claim that species diversify and adapt to their surroundings is testable because we can track the morphological similarities and differences in both species that are alive and in species that have long since died. The claim that an all-powerful being residing in a spiritual realm created the universe is not a testable claim, for a number of reasons. What is a spiritual realm? What is its position relative to the universe? How can we readily access this spiritual realm in order to observe this all-powerful being? Science can't deal with the supernatural because supernatural explanations for things are too vague. Hence, the focus on naturalism. Question number three. Uh, we hear uh, discussions on the nature of micro versus macro evolution. Okay, some argue that there isn't uh, a particular distinction between the two. Uh, some would argue that evolution is a uh, a long journey of many small steps. Now, 
it seems to me that when I hear a definition of evolution and a description of observable evolution, it falls under this idea of what some call microevolution, okay? So, my question is, if we take these particular changes that are going on, these small changes from different animals in different places, different things, and then extrapolate that out to uh, macroevolution where we don't just see the change of uh, beak forms in, in a species, we see a change of uh, birds going, uh, coming from dinosaurs, okay? So we see uh, dinosaurs morpho morphologically changing into birds, okay? That kind of change, massive morphological changes, okay? My question is, is this the fallacy of composition? What a load, literally. Seriously, a veiled accusation of the fallacy of composition? Is this the type of tripe that registers as legitimate inquiry in your mind? First off, massive morphological change does not come anywhere close to the fallacy of composition. The fallacy of composition deals with incorrectly inferring an attribute about the whole from one of its parts. When forming taxonomic classifications for life, scientists consider as many parts of the evolutionary line as they can to reach their conclusions. For example, evolution from dinosaurs to birds. You have a bird, you have a dinosaur, and you have all these other organisms that look like stepping stones to this transition. We can confidently infer that these are transitional forms because of the numerous morphological similarities and observable changes in the bones of all the specimens. For example, traits that birds share with ancestral dinosaurs include large eye holes, hollow bones, the presence of a wishbone, hinge-like ankle joints, and necks with an S-shaped curve. Nothing about the process of investigation suggests that scientists are misconstruing the whole from its parts. Not even close. Try harder. Next question. Is nature determined or random? Okay. We have arguments from both sides. I just want to know what the uh, particular opinions of those who are into this kind of thing are. Because my particular question is, is it seems to me that the, the mechanism of uh, evolution is that a uh, random mutation would happen, and then nature selects, uh, the, the pressures of nature selects for the mutation that enables a particular entity to survive. Okay. So you have a random mutation, and then it's selected for. We have natural selection, and this is the this is the uh, mechanism for evolution. Okay, but you have to have those random mutations, and I'm just asking uh, for especially the determinist uh, is random mutations a problem? And if random mutations are truly random, is this a problem for uniformitarianism? Okay. First off, uniformitarianism is not a requirement for evolution. The idea that natural processes work at the same rate as they have always done throughout time has no bearing on a theory that supposes that life adapts to a changing environment. And before you mention that the lack of uniformity among Earth's processes shatters the radiometric dating used to measure the age of rock layers, remember that geologists account for the half-life of materials in the sample as well as the ratio between daughter products and their parents both of which would affect the age of the sample. So yeah, not sure where you got that conclusion from. Second of all, the question as to whether evolution are random or deterministic is a rather binary one. Mutations are random, but natural selection is not. What traits carry on to the next generation is not determined by a crapshoot of genes, but what practical results those genes carry. To put this in an analogy, consider the evolution of the airplane. When planes first appeared, there were all kinds of bizarre and outlandish designs that people tried to get to fly. The reason we don't see them anymore is because designs were put through a selection process that weighed planes against the laws of physics and aerodynamics, and the ones that flew best under these conditions were adopted. So natural selection is not random. It presents a set of criteria influenced by the physical properties of the environment and the matter in it. 
That's why it's called selection in the first place. Number five. Is evolution sufficient for your atheism? Okay. I would say that evolution is necessary for atheism. Uh, we need an explanation for why we have what we have today as uh, species, right? In the origin of the species. Okay. All right, so we have a naturalistic explanation, but my question is, is not the necessity of it, but the sufficiency for it. And this uh, could be extrapolated out to say, uh, did you become an atheist because of uh, evolutionary uh, biology? Uh, do you feel like you're an intellectually fulfilled atheist because of evolutionary uh, biology? Uh, do you think that uh, evolution is a sufficient condition uh, for atheism? No! No! Does not compute! There are a metric fuckton of things wrong with this question. For starters, Evolution is not synonymous with atheism, nor is it a condition for it. There are many Christians that acknowledge the validity of evolution, one of which being the former Pope Benedict. Secondly, we need a naturalistic explanation for phenomena because it's all we have to go on. No one has ever proposed a sound method of investigation that can answer questions about spiritual or supernatural things. Finally, no, I am not an intellectually satisfied atheist because of evolution. No one should ever be intellectually satisfied because of anything. To say that one is intellectually satisfied is to imply that one knows everything and that there are no gaps in one's understanding. This is intellectual suicide. You will have cut off all avenues to new information. We must continually re-examine our ideas when new information comes in if we want to be intellectually honest. And I am of the opinion that only a fool puts any stock into something like intellectual satisfaction. Well, those are my answers to these <clears throat> questions. I will have a link in the description to the original video as well as reference material for the topics covered. But before we go, I would like to issue cautionary words for theists and others who want to try the stunt. Don't ask questions if you don't expect an answer. The entire point of a question is to fill a hole in one's body of knowledge. Using questions as thin disguises for an agenda is disingenuous and the practice mocks genuine curiosity. Additionally. Don't ask questions if you aren't prepared for any answer. Some will likely say that I went over the top in answering this guy's questions. I would like to remind them that they don't get to decide what is appropriate expression and what is not. And frankly, I would argue that zany antics are an excellent coping mechanism for dealing with buffoonery. I would also argue that the expectation of a top in the first place is merely a justification for hand-waving my points and ignoring the actual substance of the argument at hand. This has been The Rusty Spoon. New look, same great corrosion. Now, I'm not here to promote a particular position, uh, even though some might say that I have uh, a presupposition, a predisposition, or a particular position that I do hold, and it may come through with some of these questions. But it's not my intent to push a particular position. Well, I'm convinced.